speaker is, is Scott right? Hanselman, which I think you probably have heard of Scott. Is that, if, is that a thing? If you haven't, uh, I will introduce him from my own perspective. Um, about maybe seven or eight years ago, uh, I was just moving to Portland and I was interested in .NET. I started programming and this is one of the first people I talked to. Uh, it was long before he worked for Microsoft. He was just as passionate then about .NET and about open source as he is now. And I have so much respect for this guy and what he has done for open source wherever he's at. Thank you. And especially sweet. for the Portland area because he has been instrumental in our community. So That's very sweet. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, who has taken my children? <laughs> they are visible though, right? Okay, don't let them leave the building. All right. So I turned around and they were gone. They'd run away with some 3D printing stuff. Cool. So yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm Scott and I'm a community member. Um, and I say that because I, I, while I've been at Microsoft, this is actually year seven. Uh, I have lived in Portland my entire life. I was actually, frankly, a little disappointed that no one commented on my Portland costume. Um, this is not how I ordinarily dress, but I wanted to fit into my own town, so I, I grew this beard. Um, I got these shoes. These pants are really tight. Um, and I could not figure out why no one commented on my costume. It turns out that I had failed to <laughs> go like that. And now I am, a, I am a native Portlander, so enjoy that. Cool. Did I do something else? Did I miss anything else to go full? Someone having shooters back there? What? what? I drive a Prius. We actually give a Prius on birth. <laughs> it's Portland, Subaru. What's wrong with you? My Tesla's on order. Um, cool. So shout out to Casey. Say hi, Casey. No, like seriously, shout out. Like I'm giving you a shout out. So hi. So Casey made this lovely graphic and the graph next several graphics because I wanted to talk about kind of the state of .NET open source. Um, we actually have so many forks that in some cases, Phil, where's Phil? We broke, part, we broke GitHub, did we not? So that's good. Now, that's pretty exciting, right? Like they won't render how many forks we have because there's so many forks. And I thought, that's amazing. Everyone loves that .NET is on, uh, on GitHub. Turns out, in fact, you guys don't trust us to not just delete it. So you've, <laughs> you just forked it because you're like, ah, oh, they're going to take this away from us. Quick, make a clone. <laughs> Don't tell the bosses at Microsoft, but that is in fact the truth. Lots and lots of pull requests and lots of stars. I'm not sure why they care. I don't measure stars, but the bosses do, and they're always internally throwing these numbers around. They're going, everyone has starred this. I'm like, that's not as important as that one. So here is the stats. We did some Power BI, we did some magic, Casey counted, uh, crunched the numbers, and um, things that I thought were interesting were uh, community by group, just getting started here, we got about one in five of the pull requests are by uh, the community. Um, a very small group of people doing lots and lots of PRs, which is cool. So there's already kind of a core group. Yeah, amongst all of the projects, the main .NET projects, right? Okay, so people are de uh, dipping their toes in there is what I would take that 60% that to, uh, to mean. And this is an interesting one because I think it speaks to a problem that was talked about a little bit at the panel about open source is the difference between the computer scientists who are really excited about, you know, core effects and the core CLR and the potential for the CLR again as a runtime as, as people are, were, were and are excited about the JVM. Notice their excitement here while the, M, you know, MVC entity framework crowd. So I am reading this. This is my read as this is interesting from a scholastic and computer science and what can we build on it perspective. And these are kind of the more web developer types. So this tells me that maybe web developers and people who do CRUD for a living are less excited than maybe people who are thinking about what they could potentially build on top of that. So that's interesting. I don't know if you have a different read. Scott, yes, uh, Richard. Miguel, Miguel Casa. Yes. And, and what did he think? He thought that the, the difference here was uh, the left-hand side stuff is 
general purpose. Okay, general purpose. And then the stuff on the right hand side is specific to a particular application. Okay, so he, Richard just said that Miguel's take was general purpose toolkit. Again, things you could potentially build on top of and exploit and use anywhere, including on Xamarin and things that Miguel is interested in. And this is pretty specific, domain specific. Yeah, interesting. It'll be interesting also to see if, if DNX, that runtime part, starts to move over as people start to realize that it is, in fact, also uh, not specific to the web. So that's cool. So here's a pretty exciting announcement. Uh, Microsoft uh, planning to open source uh, .NET. This one was in 2001, though, uh, June of 2001. And I was actually talking with uh, this, this cool guy. I'm not sure. Is he from, is he Russian? You know the guy I'm talking about on the core CLR team? Shoot, I forget his name. Jan? Czech. 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 Czech, Russian, Ukrainian, yeah. No. Very, very nice Czech individual named Jan. And uh, I said, hey, we just open source.net. This is great. Blah, blah, blah. You know, it was part of the Channel 9 kind of thing we were doing. And he said, I can't do check, uh, so I won't try. He says, yes, and only for third time. <laughs> I was like, what? And he's like, I hope this one sticks. <laughs> so I was like, what do you mean only for the third time? And he's like, oh, yeah, I was, I was the guy who open source rotor. So we, this is like from him, and he's like, God, here we go again, open sourcing the thing again. So this was the open source that only people in, in uh, scholastic environments and academia can touch it, but no, no take backs. And then there was the source opened, which is the, hey, look, we open source. Dot, don't touch it. Just see, open source.net, don't touch. And then now we've actually properly done it. But I thought it was interesting because I think people sometimes forget how long this has been going on. Now, the other interesting thing, though, is that while that was over 13 years ago, and it is both exciting and shameful. Uh, this marks the beginning of that hockey stick, I think. You know, there was a long ramp up. But it's good to remember for those of us uh, who have been in the industry just a couple of years that there's a lot of historical context and a lot of work went into making this happen. And even our, uh, our harshest critics have said uh, such, such really nice things as, it'll be different this time, honest. And I know how sincere the register is when talking specifically about Microsoft and, and .NET. I also point out that I, I chopped off this clip art, but I think you can probably tell what it is. It's kind of a mess. We are, uh, here's, the, here's the secret plans, though. The idea is that finally .NET should work everywhere. It should work well. You should be able to pick the language you want, pick the platform, use .NET. Anywhere, anytime, and then you got all the little happy uh, Linux guys over here. The presumption, of course, as I said uh, a little bit before, was that Microsoft's little secret is we'd like you to buy Office. And if you buy it on an Android phone, that's fine. You can still buy Office. We would like you to buy an Xbox, and we would like you to buy Windows. And if there are any of those things that you don't want, then we're going to try to get you some other way. So it is, though, fully possible that you maybe next year will take uh, non -visual, something that is not Visual Studio on a Mac, and you will go and get .NET, and you will deploy it to Amazon, and there's no money coming in to Microsoft at all. That is possible, and we are going to enable that scenario, and we will not cripple that scenario. We will not make that not work. It is, it is promised. It is in the path, and it is, it is not me. It's not Guthrie. It's everybody. It is a sea change of people at Microsoft that are making that happen, because we want to commit to competing on a level playing field. Do you understand what I'm saying? If we get your business on Azure, it's because you like Azure better. If you use Visual Studio, it's because you like Visual Studio better. But if you use Vim and OmniSharp and it makes you happy and it feeds your spirit, that is literally what you should be doing. And if you've known me before I went to work for Microsoft, if you've known me for the last 20 odd years, this tune that I am playing here has not changed. I was talking about this seven years ago. Phil and Glenn and Richard and Emo and all of our friends, none of this has changed. We have been consistent. But we have absolutely been pushing this rock uphill. And I don't know, I can speak for, for, for Richard and the folks on the .NET Core team that it does feel like in the last couple of months that that has started to go over the top of the hill and now it's rolling back down. So I was actually talking to Phil. Hack, where's Phil? 
about some of the, the, uh, the LCA, the legal and corporate affairs things that had, Phil had to deal with, that were like nightmare meetings to get stuff done, that's now standard processes. To, you know, to do something to release as open source is now daily builds are happening. You know, it is a smooth, streamlined service. And then the ASP.NET team, the .NET team, there's a kind of this increasing bubbles. Now remember though that Microsoft is 120,000 people. Okay, and at least 100,000 of the 120,000 people are trying to sell you SharePoint. So if we just put those people aside and talk about these people, okay, so you're just going to imagine smaller groups of people. Um, there are still people at Microsoft, and I, Richard, and I keep referring to you just because you're right there and you're, you're so obviously Canadian that I have to keep referring to you. Um, do you not get the emails where it's like, are we allowed to use jQuery at Microsoft? Like, Every week there's an email like that. And it's from someone from one of those other 100,000 people. And then that is an opportunity for us at Microsoft to infect them. To infect them with open source, with the positivity of open source. But now we are getting requests multiple times a week. Not, can I use jQuery, but, hey, we've got some really great source code. We want to get it out. I am actively involved right now on open sourcing Windows Live Writer. And it, I think it's going to happen. <laughs> And this, this, this is what's so cool about this. The last six times that I tried to open source LiveWriter, people would come to us and they would give me all of these reasons why we can't do it. And now they are just asking honest questions. Good questions like, you know, what if there's a security issue? And are there any patents we need to deal with? And, and if we bump up against something, we, we pull it out. Like, for example, one of the things that we're dealing with is the spell checker in Windows LiveWriter uh, is like, 15 years old, and it came from a company that we acquired, and da 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 da. Well, it turns out in the last 15 years, we built a spell checker into Windows. So we're going to refactor via, via subtraction. But it's not a blocker. And that's what's so cool, because in the old days, uh, September, uh, in .NET, uh, you, would hit, you would hit a blocker and be like, no, sorry, you're, you know, call me when they've all died and there's a new generation of Microsofties. And the same thing, too, is that uh, when we needed an executive sponsor for, for something stupid like LiveWriter, like, what does Guthrie care about LiveWriter? He doesn't care. I emailed him. I was like, hey, will you be my exec sponsor? One line, sure. Not sure if he knows what he was replying to, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He said it was cool, so then we're going to do it. That was not possible uh, a little while ago. So when we show you slides like this, this is not a joke. This is not a, uh, there's nothing underneath this. There's no secret meetings with people going, nah, we're going to lose or we're going to win based on our merits, okay? So this is the way things were for a very long time. Varying levels of runtime support, varying app models, and varying sizes of frameworks. And it's uncomfortable. And here, things were concept compatible, right? You knew C-sharp, you knew XAML, that was the concept that you carried with you. The attempt in .NET Core is to take things like the ASP.NET 5 application model and the universal apps model and then unify these things in some kind of a modular library. Except this BCL isn't going to be many hundreds of megs in a reboot. It's going to be cafeteria style, like Node. It's going to be NuGet packages that you can go and grab from everywhere and NuGet all the things. So then the marketing view is this. But that's less interesting. The reality looks more like this. So you've got the desktop full framework, you've got WPF, Windows Forms, and ASP.NET running on full framework, and that's the one that requires a reboot and that ships with Windows. And then you've got the new .NET Core 5 that works everywhere. And then everything that is in a circle uh, there in yellow is open source. This is all reference source based, and they changed the license on that, so you can mess around in there. But um, it is not uh, on GitHub and not giving takebacks. Okay? Blah, blah, blah. Things that you're going to see, as you can obviously assume, are things like Docker. You're hearing no lots and lots about Docker. You can assume that it's going to be awesome. Uh, so you can imagine a world in the future where you're going to be in Visual Studio and you're going to be talking to a Linux machine and you're going to have some boxes on Linux and you'll have Redis cache and you'll have some Docker stuff. You'll have desired state configuration all set up. And you'll be able to go and do these things and choose the pieces that you want. But if you don't like Visual Studio, then you can do things like we saw Matt talking about with OmniSharp. And then maybe we'll see pieces of Visual Studio talking to, to OmniSharp because it's starting to be pluggable. 
These pieces are all pluggable and you can pick and choose the ones that make you happy and you've already seen the mono team just like having a ball pulling stuff into mono and giving us stuff that's good and hopefully they'll help us with some of the issues around server-side imaging that we've been um, challenged with. So here is a flow example of uh, some of the stuff that we're doing. With, you've got some code and then you bring in your modular references which are in NuGet uh, depending on how your app model works. You run it through Roslyn and then that IL can either go up into the Windows Store and then run through that native tool chain and be compiled into uh, you know, really, really fast native DLLs deployed locally with the runtime. Or in something like ASP.NET, run through the new jitter that everybody gets to use and that will work across platform as well. And then that is going to use the core CLR. And that's the master plan. It's nice and clean. One of the things that's important to remember that's very confusing and even confusing to me though is to remember that ASP.NET 5 uh, is the same thing and runs both on full framework and core CLR. There aren't two flavors of ASP.NET and that's a little confusing to some people. So when people say, oh, I need to go into production in September, should I target core CLR or should I target the full framework, the answer is you should target both. You should be taking a look and seeing, is there anything you're doing that requires cross-compilation? You need to if-def your way to glory as we start to build up pieces of the core CLR. And then also it's an opportunity for you as you run your code through the core CLR to identify gaps. And then again, like an open source project should, get involved on GitHub and say, we're calling these APIs and they're not available and we have a problem and sound those alarms and the sooner the better. That is the default? Sound the alarm? Yes. When you, yeah. So when you go find a new project, to Richard's point, that is the default. So when you bring in an existing project, you're going to want to you know, build both of those. So yeah. So this is the big build slide. Click, 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 click. It's not very pretty. And I don't know why I made it more multiple clicks. So I'm sorry. So this is yesterday. And this is today. And that is open source. Okay? So it's all about choice. And we're serious about that. And uh, I think that we feel very strongly about it, and I've said this publicly for years, that I'm going to keep pushing until they, f they fire me. And I know how passionately people feel on the .NET Core team, on the ASP.NET team. You have a lot of people who are both community members and also Microsoft employees. And we will push until we get it done. Here is a nice wordle with a description of all of the stuff that is out there that is open source and there's lots, lots more. The numbers are actually ridiculous. Thousands and thousands of forks and then now, I don't know if you guys heard, but Martin Woodward, super nice guy, is now in charge of the .NET Foundation. Hopefully going to get that on track and make it as meaningful as he possibly can. And if you go to .NET dot github dot io martin actually put that together with some folks and it has a really nice explanation of the the all of the things that are coming together now it may not necessarily be as organized as netflix dot github dot io or adobe dot github dot io but that is the goal to put these things in different locations okay so this is the plan and the uh, the goal and one other thing I wanted to point out was these blog posts by the Roslyn team and the .NET team, which I thought were really good. Check these out. So this is a blog post by the Roslyn team that Casey wrote. Did you draw that guy? You did that? I'm looking for charts because I don't read. So this is cool. This is showing when Roslyn was source open with limited contributions and then the number of community PRs, which is kind of a low number. And then when it became fully open source, the number gets a little bit higher and I'm like, oh, that's not that really impressive. But then you realize that that took nine months to do 12 and this took three to get 21. So the acceleration was really uh, significant. And also the number of issues filed by the community. So clearly we know that open source matters. This is also impressive. They're doing a lot better on this. This is uh, PRs responded to within the first hour of publishing. On there, it looks like it's cut off a little bit. There you go. 
and then issues closed in three days or less. The reason I'm showing you that is not to be self-congratulatory, but rather to show you that they track that stuff. They're paying attention. There are metrics and reports being run. They're not just hanging out. They're like, oh man, that pull request has been open for seven days. You know what I mean? If you're thinking, gosh, that's been open a long time, there are people inside of Microsoft who are also thinking that that's been open a long time. They care. Yes, please, Richard. Oh, who do we got? No, uh, I don't know if it's a secret. Oh, no? It's a secret? Yes. Uh, somewhat complaining because we actually now pay more attention to our open source contributors than we do to other teams within Microsoft. Okay, hang on a second. We're, you said that we are paying more attention to open source contributors outside of Microsoft than people who work at Microsoft? Yeah. Like employees? Yeah. Uh, Were they, did they put it on I GitHub? Did, they, did the Microsoft employee put it on GitHub? Because that's where we look. Yeah, actually, that, that is what they said. Oh, wow. Well. They said the only way to get you guys to listen to us. The only way to get you guys to listen to us. Is to put stuff on Let's put it on GitHub, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's really sad for them. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you, do you think that's a problem, Richard? I can't do this anymore. I'm sorry. Uh, I tried. I'm just too old. Yeah. It is a challenge. And it's a cultural challenge also because there's a couple different kinds of customers. There's ones that actively engage with us on GitHub and we have really substantive and interesting conversations. But there's still Connect and the Connect bug system. And there's still enterprises and corporate sites that don't go to GitHub. And there are uh, issues and bugs that come through in ways that aren't GitHub. And we're trying to figure out what that's going to look like. And we are learning. And we are taking advice from you all and looking at well-run projects. Uh, if you've ever done a pull request on the .NET Core framework, you'll see how nice the contributor's license agreement is and how it used to involve actual faxing and now involves you know, a, a, a robot that talks to you and there's like DocuSign and digital everything. It's actually kind of a joy. You should try doing a PR just to have, experience how clean that, uh, that process is. Last thing I want to say is this is what the network graph looks like, as I mentioned. Phil should fix that soon. Yeah? I think you only need to get it to work to uh, 5,000, right? There again, more response time stuff. We're making sure. I'm not sure what this one here is, though three months. It's probably the pull request to fix the fact that that says issues with one S. <laughs> so, not really, po not sure about that. But let us stop uh, having me talk and let's get Phil come up. But I just want to say in closing that uh, I appreciate you all very, very much. I am a community member first and an employee second. And I know that you guys think that that's a shtick and that I just say that and stuff like that. But I went to Microsoft for a singular purpose and I am very happy that I think that we are actually making that happen. And it is a cast of hundreds and thousands that is making it happen. And uh, you guys are family. And I want to also thank Glenn and Itamar and Troy and everybody who organized .NET Friends because I feel like it really is a .NET family reunion. And I hope to see you all here again next year. Thank you very much.